Welcome all to a meeting of the Board of Trustees. It's clear you're all having a great time. I hate to interrupt, but if you will find your seats, we will get going. Our plan is to uh, take a number of things out of order uh, because we understand that there are families here uh, who want to share with the honored member to, uh, to be recognized, and then we will retire into a closed session having to do with um, the search process, and then we will come back and we will uh, have an announcement for you. Um, it's hard to tell exactly how long these things take, but we'll do it as expeditiously as we possibly can. We turn, uh, we, we note in the role that all members of the Board of Trustees are present. And we turn our attention to um, a hearing of citizens, the first of which is Tom Gary. Tom, welcome. I can't tell you how good it is to be here, with the reason I'm going to be here. Uh, President Haslam, members of the board, President Friedlander, uh, greetings and thank you. Um, as an artist and as a teacher and as a designer, part of my makeup is about bookends. And this is kind of a bookend. You may have heard, and some of you were there, that a week and a half ago, we did the gala opening of the Garvin Theater and the Drama Music Building and the Jerkwitz Theater, and in fact have a play opening in the Jerkwitz tomorrow night. Um, we're back in business after three years, and it's been quite a three years, I'll tell you. Um, the foundation threw one heck of a party. Uh, Rick Mokler put together one heck of an opening show and movie, and even had some cameo appearances by some people I won't name. Um, and more important, all of you in the community and our colleagues got to see what has been going on up here for the last three years, and that was exciting. But to bookend it, I wanted to take just a few minutes of your time tonight and get in the record, and some of this you have heard me say, for those of you who were there at the, at the gala over the weekend. Um, but basically, just to, to give some acknowledgement. Um, November 29th of 2007, before an earlier board of trustees, I stood in this room and we had an interesting dialogue with John Romo and, and uh, Joe Sullivan and you all and some other people about the Drama Music Building. And the board members at that time, uh, Mr. Villegas, you were among them, Mr. Uh, uh, Jerkowitz, you were among them, Ms. Livingston, you were among them, um, Kay Alexander, Joe Dobbs, Sally Green, I'm going to turn my page here, uh, Des O'Neill, all voted unanimously, stunningly unanimously, to approve additional funding for the Drama Music Building that enabled us to incorporate the technology and the building infrastructure that was really needed to make it an effective instructional facility for the music and the theater departments. I said it then, I don't know how to say it now, uh, the gratitude that all of us had for that vision, that courage, because at the time there wasn't really sure where the money was coming from, although there was discussion of a bond issue. Um, and also the support that we had from the Academic Senate at that time, the Student Senate, the College Planning Council. It was a heady moment and, uh, and a decisive moment, and I think a very good moment in the history of this college because it expressed what this college in the 36 years that I taught here uh, is all about, and that is about innovation and about excellence and about collegial decision making and collegial cooperation, which is what I think SBCC is about. Um, and to all of you and to, who are there, a profound sense of gratitude for that. To this board, a profound sense of gratitude, as well as the previous board, for the support we've had over the last three years, and some of it's been difficult, and I know this. Um, you know, there were unexpected issues that were raised. There were um, time delays and everything else, but uh, always we've, we've seen through the project and the fruits of the labor in part were, some, were on display a week and a half ago and will be on display for many, many years to come. In addition to all of you, I wanna thank Dr. Friedlander um, and, and Jack Ullum, our former dean, and Alice Sharper, our former dean, who have mentored us through this project going back many years. 
and given us advice on how to proceed. Um, I want to thank Joe Sullivan, um, who, as keeper of the purse strings, but also as the, the person who understands how these processes work, has been a, a wonderful collaborator on one, keeping all of us, including me, under control um, in terms of spending the college's money and the taxpayers' money, but also in helping us to maintain the vision that went into the design of the building. And, and I've really enjoyed working with Joe in ways that I haven't been able to prior to this. And it's been a, a, an eye-opening experience. He, he got a good guy there. Um, John Sergio Fisher, who was our architect, um, a gentleman to be sure, but also somebody who responded to our needs, understood them and understood how to translate them into something that was workable and, the, and feasible. And uh, uh, just a pleasure to work with him. My colleagues in theater and music for their patience, their cooperation. Um, it's been a long time for all of them and the past few months have been excruciatingly difficult, getting settled back in and doing a gala and getting a show open and getting ready for a concert series, et cetera. Um, finally, I want to make, acknowledge one person in particular, and that's Kay Alexander. Uh, Kay had, gave us incredible support on this project, a lot of good advice in terms of how to, to, to work it through and, and, and how to think about it and in bringing it to fruition, and she deserves a lot of credit for that, and a personally a uh, debt of gratitude on my part. This has been a long journey. The first proposal for this was 10 years ago. Um, it's been well worth it for the students over the next decades who are going to benefit from this facility in getting prepared for careers, whether it's in theater or music or in related fields or even in other fields, but being able to learn and work with the kind of facilities and, tech and technology and with each other in a very demanding environment and for the thousands of community members who will come through the doors of the Garvin Theater and the Jerkowitz Theater, which are two of the finest performance facilities in this part of the country, um, who will be made better and, and have experiences through these places, through these venues and through the shows and the concerts and the other events that will be there that will enrich their lives and enrich the lives of the community. Speaking of which, uh, I want to remind you that tomorrow night we open a brand new play written by Katie Laris and her father Philip Laris and Alice Sharper called Through the Fire. It's about the experiences in Santa Barbara going back many years of fires going back to the Coyote Fire and the impact it has had on various people in the Santa Barbara community. I saw the workshop and was part of the workshop last fall. I've not seen the finished version that went into preview last night. I hear it's wonderful, and I urge you all to come see it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Hey, Tom, before you leave, you've got one, one more task. You've got to come and bring the as-built plans, hand them to Peter with a red and white ribbon around them so we never have to worry 35 years from now. I don't think I can carry that much weight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching them stack up and the stack's about We need high. them. We we'll, need them. We'll um, find a pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> the At question least, is, where are you going to put them? Uh, we'll figure that out. <laughs> Elisa Herbert right. is our next speaker. Elisa? And uh, Dr. Barbara Lotito will be next. Good afternoon, I'm President Haslin and members of the Board of Trustees and President Superintendent Friedlander. Uh, my name is Alyssa Herbert. I'm the Vice President of the Board of Directors at the Oaks Parent Child Workshop. And I just came today um, because item 6.2D on your agenda concerns the instructional services agreement that. Um, between the four PCWs and the college. And I just wanted to let you know that the four PCWs have reviewed the agreement and have all agreed with it. And we want to especially appreciate and thank President Friedlander for um, your collaboration on making this happen. So thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Barbara.
Barbara Lotito, to be followed by uh, uh, Yolanda Medina Garcia. Hello, I'm Barbara Lotito, and I teach in the Continuing Education Department, and I teach in Spanish. I teach bilingual conversation for the workplace, and I teach in the Omega program, so I wear, I wear several hats. But today I'm here to give the board and everyone here an idea of where we are with Pillar 2 as part of the Visionary Task Force in response to a request from the Board of Trustees. And also, as we're going through some major reorganization, I wanted to offer to everyone here an idea of what Pillar 2 is all about and uh, how it can be preserved and fostered. I have a handout here that I'd like to pass out. And there, there are more on the table here, and I have more for anyone else who would like to do it. First of all, I want to thank the board for just allowing us to be able to speak freely. That's, a, that's an honor and privilege that I value. And I also wanted to thank Dr. Friedlander for creating the Visionary Task Force, for inviting us to be part of it, and to go even far beyond what we expected in holding forums and inviting all of the community input. I think that uh, continuing it especially needed that connection with the community that Dr. Friedlander offered. Um, this is a preliminary report. Our, our final report we'll be working on in the next two weeks. I don't want to give away everything, but I wanted to sort of explain a little bit about the process and tell you where we are. Uh, the process has been based on six different sources of information. First of all, we had direct input from the community at three different forums. And again, we invited Dr. Friedlander to address in Spanish. We didn't do it in Spanish. He had a translator, but he did a wonderful job. The Latino uh, community, which now comprises 42.7% of Santa Barbara's population. And it was just an amazing experience for everyone there. And we also had a lot of Latinos who are interested in, in Pillar 3 and the lifelong learning. It wasn't just focused on work and jobs, and, but it was a great opportunity. Since then, for the last six weeks, both Norma Baena, who's my co-chair, and myself have met twice weekly with different groups from all of the four forums. And it, it also is a good cross-section of the college. It's been a true... Uh, effort of collaboration, which has really warmed my heart. Uh, then we also had funding guidelines from the state chancellor's office that define the state priorities. I want to remind everyone that this is enhanced funding, meaning there's money available <coughs> from the state as long as we know how to get that and how to keep these programs going. We also looked at the state of California's 2008 to 2018 occupational employment projections for Santa Barbara County. So we're looking for what, what the state is also looking for are jobs that will have high employability. We don't want to educate people and then have them not be able to find jobs. So that's a very, we're very pragmatic in pillar two. And then we also did research in current offerings by other community college, both in the state and in other states, to see what's happening. One of the things that differentiates, I think, Pillar 2 and continuing education and job preparation is that it responds to immediate needs. It doesn't have to go through long processes. Where are the jobs? Where are the needs? How do we put them together? And then we also had reports from Dr. Friedlander regarding forums <laughs> held recently with members of the business community. What do they want? What are they looking for? So this has been a very exciting opportunity. A summary of the re results, the first part of what we did was try to, to define the parameters. Where do we fit in? We have vocational ESL. How does that fit in? We have the credit program. We have professional development. And I will say again, the collaboration has been phenomenal. And basically, here's a brief summary of what we've defined. The population we serve are primarily pre-college level students. They're not ready for college. They need us to help them, or they're not interested at this time in going on to college. Many of them are employed what we call full-time plus and have families. 
and they're often employed in low paying jobs and they want to do better. And they are either seeking immediate employment if they're not employed or they need to be retrained because they've lost their jobs. They need the following. They need short term courses and that's one of the things that Dr. Friedlander has urged us to consider. Quick turnover. We need to be able to schedule things and we have to schedule them at times that these students can can attend, basically Fridays, Saturdays, evenings, even Sunday classes. One of our meetings meets at Friday at 6.30 because that's when the students are available. Uh, they need targeted outreach and marketing. So how do we present this to the public? They need evaluation of prior academic experience. Um, I just had a student in my bilingual conversation class who's from Oaxaca, from the mountains. He's never been to school and he wants to do better. Uh, the, the, we also need to be able to test to determine their proficiency levels, and these students need to be advised, coached, enrolled, and tracked in their pro progress. And they need to be prepared to enter the workforce, some for the very <coughs> first time. So how do we do that? Well, uh, my own background is I was a tenured professor at the University of Connecticut, and why do I teach in non-credit? <laughs> It's, I have no job security, I'm paid a lower rate because I love it and because I feel that there is such a need and that we need to meet that need. And so the faculty are both academically qualified and they're also, in addition, well versed in methodology in teaching older adults as well as those from different linguistic and cultural backgrounds. For many, these courses are their first contact with higher education, and it's often the faculty members who wind up counseling them and helping them along. So we do a lot. In addition, of course, we prepare our lessons. We schedule classes not to meet our needs, but the students' needs. We record and report attendance and evaluate progress of students. We actually actively recruit students. I have gone around with my flyers in, in Isla Vista, and in, uh, on the east side just to let people know what we're doing. So we need more support with that. And we also work to retain students and find out if they're not coming, we make calls, all of the above. And then we write course outlines and that's where we are in this process of making sure that these courses are approved and they have to be now part of a certificate sequence. Continuing education faculty are paid at a lower hourly rate than their credit counterparts. <coughs> We are no longer reimbursed at lab rate for faculty member meetings or other time commitments above the teaching hours, and we're not included in the college senate, except for one representative. We are contract employees with no job security. What about the administrative functions? Because I know you're looking at how can we administrate everything. Um, the current pillar two are the job readiness and training programs. Administrators need to recruit, interview, qualify, hire, and fire faculty members. Currently, there are 50 just in this area of job preparation and workforce prep. They Dr. need to orient and train Dr. faculty Notito, to meet the special needs. If, forgive me for interrupting, but I, your, Have your, I gone over? your three minutes went by a long time ago. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, it's, I thought it, it said five in the minutes. I, I, I misunderstood. Yeah, in five minutes is all. If you, if you can wrap it up, that would be I will. wonderful. Okay. Thank you. So there is a lot of administrative functions that need to be done. So I want you to think about all of this. I put it in writing so you can have it and be able to make decisions that will support this very underserved population. I appreciate your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Uh, Yolanda, you are next. Thank you. President Haslin, uh, members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Friedlander, it is my pleasure to be here today um, to share with you that a, uh, the Association of Community and Continuing Education has awarded Santa Barbara City College and in particular recognized Dr. Friedlander for his initiating the Continuing uh, Education Visioning Task Force. So it's a pleasure to be here to acknowledge that and I wanted all of you to know as well as the community as Barbara mentioned, it is a very inclusive process 
and um, the state um, is eager to look at uh, you know the results and the outcomes of all of this effort. So thank you very much for your support and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. Vanessa Patterson. Vanessa. Hi, um, I'm just uh, here as uh, Vanessa Patterson, Executive Director of the Foundation for Santa Barbara City College. I wanted to share, two minutes ago I was going to announce that we had raised 398000 but I get to now announce we've raised $402,500 for the campaign right, for student hey. success. Uh, really desperately um, can change dramatically but uh, that's before the match so um, again we're in the last four days of the campaign for student success we'd like to raise an additional ninety eight thousand dollars between now and Monday evening and I think we can do it together so I wanted to invite you to Monday evening a campaign cleanup hosted by the foundation board um, from 5 to 8 uh, in the Luria Press Center. Dinner will be provided and was donated by Frescoes. Um, and uh, please come and enjoy and make some calls. I also want to say that in this campaign, um, we've expanded and grown our donor base by 100% um, in the period of just um, under six weeks. We've actually increased our entire donor base by, again, 100%. And we've had 33 faculty members set up teams and invite people and we've had some major success that's taken place on campus and I just want to say thank you um, thank you to entire SBCC and together hopefully 98,000 more and we'll get that entire 750,000 for our students thank you thank you Ben We, we move quickly to item 1.7 which is a recognition of this year's annual faculty Lecturer, Dr. Friedlander. Is Kathy here? No, I think she's among the miss. Oh, yes, she is here. Vanessa would probably be happy about it. Hey, Vanessa, you, 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 you'd be um, closer to your goal. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I will, because uh, I don't have signing authority over this, so uh, even if I wanted to, uh, it'll bounce. Anyway, um, the highest honor our faculty bestow on to another faculty member is being um, selecting one of their peers as the annual faculty uh, lecture. They do it based on feedback they've gotten get from students, other faculty, and it's based on teaching excellence, um, service to the college, and service to the community on behalf of the college. And uh, this year, they selected Kathy O'Connor as the um, as faculty lecturer of the year. It's quite a tribute to Kathy. Um, and Kathy chose to give a speech, which was excellent, on. Um, the value of physical education, to give the history of physical education, where it started, how it got into the curriculum, and um, more importantly, you know, why what they teach is good for all students in terms of um, their performance um, in, in her other classes. She cited a lot of research um, to validate that. And in the end, it ended with a plea to get us all moving. <laughs> and so you all did. We all moved out of the gym. Um, so, so it worked. Um, you got immediate results. But anyway, Kathy, I thought um, you, I know you worked all year long preparing for that um, speech, and um, there's so much content, but you got your main points across and across well, because people are still talking about what they took away from that lecture. So on behalf of the college, I want to um, do two things. One, thank you. Two, present you with um, a certificate of recognition. That's nice. Really nice. <laughs> and it's Jeff, it's I 
I just. About 30 minutes if you want to enter a speech, so go ahead and do it now. No, it was too long as it was. I just want to thank all the, my colleagues, my students, uh, and all the board members who came, and, and uh, I really appreciate that. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to get up and dance. It didn't work too well in the gym. You sort of stood up, but people didn't really dance much, so I guess that part didn't work too well. But my department was great. They all came and participated in our students, and so that part was really fun. So thank you very much. Sue, uh, we move to a part of the um, assignment dealing with uh, Kazue Morrison, who is going to be recognized for 25 years of service to Santa Barbara City College. And who's doing that? Ah, okay. <laughs> Dean Alice Sharper will introduce Kazue. And that is on page six at the top of the page if you are following the agenda. Good afternoon, Dr. Haslin, members of the board, Dr. Friedlander, and everyone out there. We're here to honor Kazue Morrison for her longevity here at the college. And there are many colleagues of Kazue's from the library here, and it's a, it's a wonderful show of support and celebration. And Kazue's colleagues put together a beautiful statement um, that I would like to read to you. Kazue is a person who is both well loved and respected by her co workers. Not only does she thoroughly know how to do her job, and probably everybody else's job as well, but she is helpful, caring, and kind hearted way beyond what her job requires. She once helped an international student who was being mistreated by her host family find a new and better place to live. This grateful Japanese student continued to keep in contact with Kazue even after returning to her own country, and in fact, once flew from Tokyo to Kazue's hometown just to visit with Kazue when she was on a family vacation in Japan. On a regular basis, Kazue provides meals for students who might otherwise not have anything to sustain themselves. In one instance, she not only encouraged a student to continue on with his, his education, but she made sure that he did so by driving him to the university where he had an entrance interview scheduled. This student is now completing his first year in his field of study at that same university. Kazue doesn't wait for people to ask her for help. She seeks out whoever might be in need and follows through in any way that she can. We're very grateful that you're with us and congratulations on your longevity, 25 years at Santa Barbara City College. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure working at the great people, great place. I'm so happy. Thank you so much. All right. We, we move to item 3.2. Um, recognition of the outstanding classified employee. I would invite uh, Liz Auchincloss to come forward to make the presentation. And the, uh, the agenda item that we're covering is on page 11, should you wish to follow me in your hymnal. Suspense is mounting. You can <laughs> feel it. Well, it's Jack's first time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
I'm not going to touch that. I want to go to the Yes, Jack. Continue. <laughs> Um, Dr. Haslin, <laughs> members of the board, uh, Dr. Freelander, it's my uh, honor and responsibility to uh, give the awards for the Classified Employee of the Year and the four honorable mentions. Now, all these employees are outstanding. I mean, we had to pick one. But um, what I'm going to be reading is excerpts from the nominating forms. Anybody on the college campus can nominate. So sometimes they're nominated by their department, sometimes by their colleagues, sometimes by whoever. But uh, we get the nominations and we have to make a selection. So I'll start with the honorable mentions and work my way up to the uh, uh, employee of the year. Okay, the first honorable mention works as a laboratory technician in the chemistry department. She is responsible for a myriad of duties associated with this department. She, was, she has always done her job excellently, but has, gone, but has recently gone way above and beyond what would be expected of someone in this position. Our department usually has two full-time lab techs, but because of an unexpected resignation last summer, she stepped up and valiantly tried to do the work of both lab techs. While the department was in the process of hiring another lab tech, she hired, trained, and supervised many student workers. The amount of work she did during this difficult time is hard to put into words, and her attitude throughout the semester was excellent even when she was trying to do the work of two people. She showed how dedicated and capable of a worker she is as a lab tech. In addition to this unusual semester, she has taken on the college's financial responsibilities to heart and has been working on pitting vendor against vendor so that our department can get the cheapest price for our equipment and material that we need to run our program. This takes many phone calls to vendors when it is, would be far easier to choose one and simply order from them. She has shown superlative dedication to our college. Please recognize Tracy Reynolds as a 2012 Classified Employee Honorable Mention. Thank you. You know, I'd really like to thank um, the members of my department. Without Sally coming in to help me run the window when uh, we had 25 students backed up waiting to get equipment, it would have made things a lot tougher. And without Gary loaning me uh, his ear to bend all the time, um, I won't say what, what those words were that I used, but, but uh, he was always there to listen and support me when I needed it. And I uh, just want to thank everybody. You guys are great. and, and it's. That's a great honor for you guys to have recognized the hard work. Honorable Mission works as a information system specialist in the information technology department. She is truly an unsung hero. She goes about her business quietly and effectively. Many of my colleagues have mentioned her responsiveness and follow through in helping them solve their web related issues. She developed and taught the first classes in Omni Update, the tool the college uses to maintain pages on the college website. She also teaches comp classes as an adjunct instructor. She is curr currently completing a master's degree in science, education, online teaching, and learning at Cal State East Bay. She actively supports local culture events such as First Thursday Art Walk, local theater productions, museums, art galleries, and festivals. She has volunteered her technical expertise to the Page Youth Center assisted a UC Berkeley research instructor in building a website for research on schizophrenia and it, it has assisted local artists with shoots. She stands out in her determination to make the part of the world she inhabits a better place by treating 
others kindly and fairly refraining from negative comments or actions and expediting help desk requests while keeping lines of communication open. Please recognize Jennifer Robinson as an honorable mention. Just wanted to thank everyone. Um, I'm an Indiana girl who's lived in Santa Barbara for about six years now, and uh, we don't have community colleges even close to what Santa Barbara Community College is. So for me to work here and be a part of this, um, it's just an amazing thing. Um, I look forward to coming to work. I look forward to doing my job. Um, we have great departments. I've had great supervisors since I've been here, and um, it's really something that we need to preserve and work hard. Um, to do our best to give the best to students and that's what I've seen as I've worked with different departments. We all want what's best for students and we all work really hard to try to get that and um, I'm just thankful that I get to be a part of that. Our mission is a senior office assistant who is currently working on the class as an administrative services coordinator. She stepped up to this position after the college's risk manager left the college for another position and was not replaced. She's taken the bull by the horns and has continued leading the community services department in generating revenue and establishing great relationships with, bi with local businesses and community members. She facilitates meetings committees and deals with conflicts with professionalism. She comes in on the weekends to check that things run smoothly and takes the time to walk through information with anybody in need. She also manages a stressful and tedious job supporting workmen's compensation that not many have the patience or the capability of doing. She does both duties with the thoroughness, respect, and confidentiality required. She is also pursuing more education and working on the requirements for risk management certification. Her enthusiasm is refreshing and wonderful to see. She has stepped up to the challenge of work, load responsibilities and challenges with a smile. She is proud to be an SBCC employee and continues to do a thorough job regardless of the obstacles presented to her. Please recognize Adrian Betty as an honorable mention. I just wanted to say it's an honor to be recognized and it's, you know, in the short time that I've worked here, it's been such a great support system for, for me and I'm just happy to have the opportunity to expand and, and grow here at SBCC. Thank you. Next honorable mission works as an ESL student services assistant. She's been working at SBCC since 2006. She has always approached her job and responsibilities as a true professional and always has a smile and a positive attitude for everyone she works with. Her duties include handling instructor requests in the ESL department, overseeing classroom scheduling, working with ESL students answering the many questions they have and everything else that falls under her job title. She is bilingual, which of course is a great help to the students she supports. She is constantly juggling 10 things at once, since she has 20 or so instructors to work with, as well as hundreds of students, as well as staff and administration. She does all this with an ever-present can-do attitude, and she is genuine pleasure to work with. 
She volunteers frequently at Washington School where her two children attend. She's also been a big sister to troubled youth. In addition, she tutors students informally both on and off campus. She promotes the college and the community by making contact with three local public school districts to promote SBCC programs. She been, has been attending SBCC for the last few years during her off time and has attended conferences and workshops directly related to ESL. Please recognize Raquel Alvarado as an honorable mention. Thank you. It's really an honor to uh, be nominated. It's not only where I work, but almost like my second home. I've been here for ever. Um, <laughs> I work with people who I think of as family and my actual family. I love my job. My boss drives me crazy. I won't mention any names, but Roberto, you know who you are. <laughs> but thank you very much for everybody, and it's a pleasure working with you guys. The 2012 Outstanding Classified Employee of the Year works as the Assessment Coordinator for Continuing Education. She's been giving outstanding service to SBC students in many ways for over 20 years. She started in the ESL office on the main campus and later worked in the assessment office there. 2003, she transferred to the Wake Center where she was the Dean's Administrative Assistant and also worked helping students, staff, and instructors in the front office. She was promoted to the new assessment coordinator position for continuing education when the position was created about three years ago. She designed the continuing education assessment system and continues to be in charge of it. Her combination of professionalism and compassion for others is what has created this program. The ESL student's first exposure to school is very important. The friendly, professional, and encouraging orientation and assessment they receive as their first experience when they come to school gives them motivation and encourages them to return to class. She gives them what that calmness and reassuring presence that all will be okay and that they will be in good hands and placed in the skill level appropriate to their needs in order to succeed here at SBCC. Besides her work for SBCC, she has been active with her church and does a lot of community volunteer work to help people with cancer and their families, especially children of people with cancer. She's a matriarch and a pillar of strength for her family. A number of people in her large extended family have had serious health problems. She's been right there for all of them, helping them in so many different ways. She's also taken many professional development classes here at Santa Barbara City College. And now that her sons have graduated from high school, she wants to go back to school to earn her degree. She has many of admirable qualities. She is honest, kind, compassionate, strong, capable, trustworthy, and professional. She has been described by many as being humble with strength. Everyone who works with her and is touched by her in any capacity benefits from all of these good qualities. Please recognize Ahelia Aguilera as the 2012 Classified Employee of the Year. I just like to thank everyone who, especially my supervisors and my uh, teammates who have always helped me to be a better person and employee. Thank you. Um, I hope by listening to some of these descriptions of the employees you get a feel for 
some of the some of the many jobs and duties and responsibilities that classified staff have. These are some of our best. We all have great employees, but, but these are our best for this year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. We come to that part of our agenda where it would be appropriate to move to go into a closed session for the purpose of, of considering the two items on our agenda. Is there such a motion? Okay, motion is made. Is there a second? Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay? Motion is carried. I will uh, do my very best to come back to you very soon in session. And you're no doubt here for, for an announcement. Um, last, last fall, this Board of Trustees set out to, to create a process that would be inclusive, encompassing, positive, and it was to conduct a search for the next superintendent president. The first thing we did was to engage the services of a, of a professional search firm. Um, uh, we interviewed various groups of people. We settled on the group that we thought would most effectively represent us. We hired Stanton Chase to, to go out and, and scour the country for the best possible people who would represent uh, this college as its superintendent president. Uh, we asked them not to go after just people who were looking for jobs. We asked them to go after people who had jobs. And we wanted, without apology, to steal them away from, from effectively doing a job wherever they were. The second thing we did was to engage a, a community search committee made up of various aspects of of this college community, faculty, staff, management, representatives of the, of the foundation for Santa Barbara City College, people from the community, students, continuing education, credit. Fifteen people met and worked tirelessly to, to get the job done. Stanton Chase was able to recruit nearly 40 candidates for our job. They turned over to the search committee more than half of their, of their selectees. And this committee, chaired by Dean Nevins and Ron Gallo, worked intensely to narrow the field even further. Ultimately, they were able to give us four candidates. And they, I can remember when they came to the board, they said, these are excellent candidates, any one of whom could do this job. And I thought at first, wow, that's cool. That's a nice problem to have. And as I thought about it further and came to realize that they had really given us an impossible task uh, because they were right. These were four excellent candidates, and we had to choose one. Uh, the, the difficulty of which is epitomized by the fact that we met most of the day on Saturday, we met again today, <coughs> we, Monday. we, and Monday, yes, one forgets. Um, so we worked very, very hard, and we finally have come to a decision. Um, the, uh, and I need, to, I need to report out of closed session two decisions. One is the decision to um, uh, approve a contract um, that will come back to us on May 10th because frankly it wasn't ready uh, to, be, uh, to be agendized for today's meeting and so it'll be finished on May 10th. And the second is to announce to you uh, the selection of Lori Gaskin as our president. And we, wait just a minute. I want you to repeat what you just did because Lori, <laughs> Lori is uh, uh, going to come on, I think. Should be able to see. 
see us. And she's going to see us, and we're going to see her. Oh, this is the part where technology <laughs> does its thing. This is where we have our best people on. Okay, you see me? No, we can't. I can hear you, though. You can see us? privilege to, uh, to officially invite you to serve Santa Barbara City College as our next superintendent president. You're supposed to say something. <laughs> I'm, um, I, I'm so grateful to the board for uh, showing me this, this vote of confidence. Please don't tell me on, I'm on some high-def, very large screen with my face <laughs> on the wall, uh, because you'll see tears uh, in my eyes. But I'm so grateful um, to the entire board, the entire institution. I'm, I'm filled with uh, such humility and uh, tremendous amount of eagerness to serve our students, and um, real pride in now fulfilling a, a longtime dream of being able to join the City College family, which I've wanted to do for a long time. And um, certainly unbridled optimism for us and our, our future. I am, uh, I'm just ecstatic. It's, um, you know, I'm gonna date myself, but you know the, uh, the great commercial, I love this commercial, and I'm not even a, a fan of pro football, but uh, you remember when a team would win the, the Super Bowl and uh, somebody would say, you know, you've just won the Super Bowl. What are you going to do now? And I feel I've just won the Super Bowl and I'm going to go out and buy some red, white, and black clothes. Let's <laughs> <laughs> do it. Thank you, Lori. And, uh, you know, my go get a suitcase or something and start packing. <laughs> I, I would love to. That, that truly would be an honor to start packing. Well, Absolutely. Lori, when you buy those clothes, buy it at our bookstore. <laughs> oh, no. Hey, come off, we're keeping that in the black. Absolutely. Yeah, we need the money. Yeah. Thank you. We'll get back to our meeting now. Thank you, Lori. The, uh, the vote on the, the contract was unanimous. The vote on the uh, selection was 5-2 uh, with uh, uh, trustees uh, Vegas and Jerkowitz uh, not, uh, not in agreement to the selection. Uh, the other five were in agreement to the selection. And I think this is an indication of how tough how tough, how really tough this decision was. Uh, and I think that is um, high praise for the other candidates as well. And I hope that that gets back to them because I, I mean it with all my heart. Okay, we move on to the agenda, which has been interrupted any number of times. And if, if there are those of you who would like to go away, I, I can understand why. But if you'd like to stay for the exciting elements that are about to happen, you're welcome to stay as well. Uh, we move on to item 1.5, which has to do with the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of March 22nd. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Motion is made. Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, Maury Jerkowitz. Are there... Uh, are there comments about the minutes? Are there any corrections? Yes. Um, I have a minor amendment. Um, I'd just like to clarify, and now I've lost my place. Um, page five at the top, 
where we have the statement that the musicians under professional volunteers are removed from the consent agenda and will be considered as an action item. I'd just like to clarify by adding at the request of Trustee Croninger because her husband is one of the volunteers. That was the reason for that. Okay, without objection, um, that is added. Are there other concerns or questions about the minutes? Hearing none, the minutes are approved without objection. Um, and one abstention. And one abstention? Two abstentions. Two abstentions, okay. Good. Uh, communications, the uh, report by the Academic Senate, President Dean Nevins. I have to follow that. <laughs> you have to follow that. Uh, Dean, again, from, uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for chairing or co-chairing that committee, and I hope you will pass on. I, I was wondering if Ron would be here, but uh, you guys did a superb job making life really difficult for us. Thank you. Uh, the committee did a fantastic job. Everyone there on the committee was wonderful. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with Ron, and also all the people on the committee were just so involved in the process. Everyone did their homework. Everyone was engaged. And when we were discussing the different candidates, I looked forward uh, in, with great interest to everyone's comments because people shared insights I hadn't even thought of, and you know your your thoughts would shift during the conversations, and that's a very high mark for a committee. So people did a fabulous job. I was honored to serve on that committee. It was really wonderful, and many people who had served on many committees said this was the most collaborative committee they'd ever worked on. So it was it was a wonderful process. So thank you very much for the opportunity. And as I fumble with my iPad here a little bit. Um, to, uh, to talk about the Senate. Oh, by the way, uh, it's too bad Kathy's not here. She said no one danced during her presentation. I was dancing. It was really sad, and you don't want to see it, but uh, <laughs> I was attempting to dance. Uh, so uh, President Haslund, members of the board, uh, Superintendent, um, President Jack Freelander. Um, so we're, uh, the faculty is kind of, we're like the horses running for the barn now because we can see that it's, it's getting to be finals week. People are really focused on kind of the end of the semester, getting their classes together, making sure students have feedback, and getting prepared for finals week. So uh, things are really moving along, and the faculty are really engaged in that process. Um, since, our, since my last report, the Senate's only met once, and the reason why was we had a really wonderful presentation by Kathy O'Connor, uh, overlapped both in the Senate meetings, and then also we had an issue where uh, there was a scheduling uh, conflict where our longevity uh, celebration overlapped with Senate. And uh, unfortunately, that meant that uh, we were losing quite a few senators. And so we were missing so many people, we decided it probably wouldn't be a good idea to have a vote, especially on plus or minus grading, uh, missing five or six senators. So we've moved it to next week. Um, however, we have been working. Our participatory governance process has been chugging along. We've uh, approved the uh, rankings through both PNR and ITC. So uh, Planning and Resources came forward with their recommendations for uh, expenditures, and so did the uh, Instructional Technology Committee. And I want to thank both those chairs, uh, PNR's chair Kim Monda and also ITC's chair, uh, Lori Vasquez, for doing a fantastic job cutting down the expenses because they had a huge number of requests initially, and they got together individually with the chairs and just really cut those requests down to bare bones of things that we need to keep the college going. So I really want to thank them for their work. It was an awful lot of work by both their committees and both their chairs to get us to a place where we can at least seriously consider addressing those real needs um, in a very, very tight budgetary time, as you all well know. Um, we also um, are working on the program discontinuance policy. What we decided to do was, um, it was we had originally kind of accelerated the process a bit, but then it turns out that for where we are right now, our current process will be sufficient, but we are going to work towards improving the process, and by the end of the fall, we should have a completed process for you to review. So that has to go through consultation with other groups, too, and of course, obviously, the board. But uh, we'll have something for you. And basically, the idea is to improve what we have uh, rather than just something start whole, from whole cloth. And we've looked at a lot of uh, discontinuance policies. In particular, obviously, we're looking at uh, the discontinuance policy followed by Lori's institution, <laughs> since she'll be bringing that with her. And um, that's really all the report is for now. Okay. Any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, JJ is here. He is not here, but I'll make a report. Okay. I'm Joel Ingram, Senator. <laughs> don't don't trip. Nice. I've got good balance. I haven't slept yet, but I've got good balance. <laughs> How are we doing? All okay. this we have good liability insurance, also. So uh, we have confidence. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't have confidence. Don't trip. <laughs> well, confidence that I'll be taken care of. Uh, members of the board, President Haslin, uh, Superintendent, President Dr. Freelander. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's uh, quite a meeting. Uh, I have a lot to take back to the. To their meeting. 
The, we're coming to an end of the semester. Uh, we first wanted to share a couple of things that we're doing in order to expand our, our presence with our community. Uh, not only as, uh, not students, but the student body representing city, Santa Barbara City College. We've been participating and volunteering as a group in Earth Day and also in Relay for Life. Uh, I think it's important to uh, voice out that we are willing, even though we are full-time students and taking responsibilities and committees and everything else, we, we can still do a lot more. Uh, we're not holding a, a meeting this Friday. We, we are attending uh, the General Assembly. Uh, a lot of other members are leaving today to, uh, all, for all the community college that students that want to scream at each other. We're going to do that uh, this weekend, uh, all in, in good terms, of course. Uh, this last Friday, we had a uh, meeting with uh, Dean. He came to our meeting presenting the, I wouldn't say a problem, but uh, an issue that we wanted to resolve as a team. Um, we wanted to get together and form a forum, as you um, might have already known, the cancellation forum that was great organization. On Friday, uh, senators got together and we organized, in a matter of hours, flyers. We wanted to send out campus. It's not to, what we're trying to focus on is an organization of coming together, collaborating with each other, and having the, those three key presentations. One from the IA, from budget, and the presentation that we were going to give from each Senate. And it would have been a great process that we're looking to possibly, possibly do in the future to have more collaboration from the students and the faculty working together, putting these minds together, working as a team, not only from the top, but also from the bottom, and giving those ideas that sometimes are never thought of. Uh, we're also in, this is the week for elections. Uh, so on Monday, you will know the results on the final on president and those are, who will run for uh, officer positions for next year. Um, on, other than that, uh, if there's any questions for me, uh, it's kind of informal in my presentation. It's kind of last minute, sorry. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Luck on finals. <clears throat> Liz, do you have something additional? You do. Darn. <laughs> Dr. Haslin, members of the board. Um, I wanted to thank the board for the opportunity to serve on the search committee for the superintendent president. I wanted to thank uh, Dean Evans and Ron for their chairing. Uh, I think they did an excellent job. They, they let everyone have their say and they listened to everyone and they um, were able to uh, work, uh, help us work through whichever agreements or disagreements we may have had with the, all the candidates. And we actually did see all the candidates' information. So we had all that. Uh, on another topic, I wanted to thank uh, Joe Sullivan and Dr. Freelander for the budget forums we've had. I think it was a fiscal committee of the board that I attended where um, some of the board members didn't feel this, that maybe the college community understood that we were in a fiscal crisis. I think after these budget forums, if I can let you know that I think everybody understands that now. So hopefully we can work collaborative collaboratively to reach some sort of solution to the issue. But I wanted to, to thank uh, the VP and the President for the forms that they've had, and I guess they have one more. But I think that was, I know it took a lot of work to put them together, but I think it, it really helped the community to understand what we're up against. So thanks. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Jack? Okay. Um, Angie reminded me three times that um, we have to be out of here seven, ten after seven. So um, I'll keep my remarks, of all the wonderful things, um, very brief, relatively speaking. <laughs> Forget your relatives, just be brief. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, call, I'll talk to my relatives and uh, th th that'll be a brief. Um, yeah, anyway, we, you know, Kathy O'Connor gave her faculty lecture and most of you, a number of you were there, which is appreciated that. Um, on April 13th, a couple of Fridays ago, we had um, Ed Inc's uh, art installation got rained out, but we had a you know, function. Then we had the annual student art show. We gave out, um, I don't know how many scholarships we gave out and awards to students. The work was terrific, the students did. And I was watching when I was there how many pieces had already been bought you know, off the walls. You know, that, you know, that red marker on no longer for sale. Um, but the work was just, just terrific. And also it was Dane Goodman's last um, ex um, gallery exhibit because he's retiring. He's done one heck of a job putting that gallery on the map. Um, the, um, 
Then we had the Garvin reopening, and um, it's already been mentioned. But um, I know I talked to um, Pam Lasker, a box office supervisor, and on Monday the phone was ringing off the hook for people buying um, t season tickets and tickets for the season, so um, it worked. And um, it was a wonderful uh, three days. On um, April 17th, the um, Montecito Rotary every year um, has a lunch meeting at the college, and they always give scholarships to students in our career technology education programs. First, it started out with two, three. The last couple of years was five. This year, it was eight scholarships of $1,000 each, so it was really generous, and, um, and that was very successful. Um, the budget forums have been great, um, and we have the last one tomorrow. Very well intended. Um, the um, Lancaster Speech Tournament was last Monday night. And the students, the finalists, were just great speeches on Generation Y. And, um, and just hearing them talk about their generation and critiquing it, usually they're pretty hard on themselves. Um, I thought I was in touch, but I realized um, in some of those issues I had no idea um, what was going on. It was really eye-opening for me. But the speeches were very good. Um, on, um, yesterday, you know, um, we had we recognized 31 faculty members who have been teaching at the college 25 years or more. And Trustee Livingston was there, and I appreciate uh, to her being there. It was fun. We had a good event, and um, and just amazing how those faculty members, what they started this college, you know, uh, and some of the programs are just thriving, and how engaged so many of them still are. It's just wonderful. Um, and then um, just before this event, you know, tonight's meeting, ELPS opened up their new computer and tutorial labs. And Marsha Wright reported to me that this semester, and this is not even final exams yet, we've had 600 unduplicated students take advantage of those labs. And they've already put in 4,000 hours. So I commented that it would probably be by end of finals 8,000 hours, <laughs> you know, students being students. But it's just marvelous, you know, and so I really had to compliment Marsha because she had that dream seven, eight years ago, and uh, she wouldn't let go of it. So we made it happen, but um, it wouldn't have happened um, had it not been for her. And um, we had um, a surprise announcement. I learned about it from the LA Times that our college was once again um, selected in as the top 10% of the community colleges nationwide for the new Aspen Comp Award competition. So now we have um, until May 25th to get our application in to be considered you know, the next round. So we get to repeat the whole process that we did last year. But we're the only two other schools from California were um, selected. But we're the only school in California, and one of the few nationwide, that were invited back twice. So it's really, again, a tribute to um, what the college is doing. So that's um, my report. But there's a lot. I mean, I can't believe all the activities are taking place. Faculty are having um, great guest lectures, bringing people in from the community. Uh, they're, part, they're finding out who, what big names in their field are here and are getting them to come. They're partners, they're partnering with the Arts and Lectures at UCSB, getting speakers. Um, and I just, you know, all of them having, um, the clubs having um, recognition events, honors events. So the dream, a number of years ago, the vision was to have student life in this campus. And I'll tell you, we have student life. Um, and um, so it's just a wonderful, wonderful environment. So um, I'm happy that uh, you selected Lori Gaskin. You know, she'll do a great job, and um, you know, college will be in good hands. So it was a good choice. So thank you for doing that. That's my report. Okay. Uh, item E, uh, report from board members, committee chairs. Anybody have? Yeah. Yeah. Just briefly, I just wanted to thank um, yeah, thank Joe and uh, Jack also for the budget forums and getting the information out to the college community. Um, we have a big job in front of us, and it was my goal when I came on the board here to help with the transparency, and I hope uh, that we're succeeding, all of us, in that goal. Uh, also, there are so many people that came to the study session a, a few days ago, and that was really encouraging, because, again, the more people we can get that understand the issues in front of us, we'll get, have more opportunity for creative solutions. And um, 
watches a participatory governance work. So thank you for your attention there. Also, since we're talking about money, I thought I could put in one more plug for the foundation's campaign for student success. Uh, 98,000 more dollars to reach the goal of 500,000. And I hope all the board members will join me in making a pledge towards this, uh, this drive. And you know how often we're on TV, right? Maybe they could roll a number and say this would be the time to pull, pull out your credit card. But you can call the foundation at 730-4401 and make a contribution. That would be great to do it by April 30th and you'll get the part of the matching gift. $100 buys a textbook, $100 pays for a student for one week in a summer program that introduces at-risk youth to the college experience. So these are things we want to accomplish in our community, and thank you, everybody. Trustee Mackey, Macker, uh, can you tell me that number again? I didn't quite get it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, it, I don't know if it's rolling across the bottom of the screen. It's 730-4401, and let's all participate in, in doing this for our community. Thank you. I take it there's no prohibition against calling twice if if you no, feel so. you can so call inclined. twice, or you could just double up on the credit card. Other, uh, <laughs> other reports from board members. Anybody? Okay, we move on to item two, uh, governing board. The first is resolution number thirty-five. Sue, will you walk us through this one? So take a walk. <laughs> She's been working very hard. This lately. is a, a resolution that authorizes uh, district elections, and uh, uh, I have I have the. Excuse me. Thank you. I didn't realize I was going to speak to this one, but I I think I can, and if not, somebody will uh, either drag me off the stage or correct me. Um, this is required uh, as a part of the process of upcoming. Um, elections and uh, consolidation uh, the there are two let me talk about 35 and 36 okay um, so 35 is an order um, um, for for elections for three members of this governing board I think that one is fairly straightforward the one that caused a little confusion and has been modified in the packet is 36. And 36 is a little confusing because we have a board policy that does exactly what this resolution says we're supposed to resolve to do. So what we have done is modified it so that you are resolving, and the, the key seems to be to get a vote board member by board member on this. So you are resolving uh, that um, you have a board policy which addresses this. And I think the value of doing the resolution in this particular way is that it reminds everybody that that policy is there. So we've done it. We have it on our books, but we're reminding the county that we've resolved. This is board policy 2100, is that Yes, right? yes. And it is specifically referenced. I think you should all have received a modified version of. We did. Uh, OK, excellent. OK. So we are asked to approve the following resolution. Uh, if I am correct, this is uh, whereas section 13307 of the elections code of the state of California requires this board to adopt certain policies in regard to statements of candidates who run for office as members of the governing board of the district. Now therefore be it resolved that this governing board does hereby determine that board policy 2100, which is the one I referenced, uh, board elections, shall remain in full force and in effect until rescinded by this board. Uh, is there a motion to, um, to support this, this resolution? Motion is made Moved. by, okay, and seconded. Is there discussion of the resolution? Maury seconded it. Okay. Is there discussion? If not, all in favor? Oh, you're so right. Yeah. Huh. Trustee Ann? Aye. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Cronenberg? Aye. Trustee Haslund? Aye. Trustee Haslund? Aye. Trustee Bertholet? Aye. Trustee Bertholet? Aye. Trustee Bertholet? Aye.
Aye. Okay. Um, does that that takes that's resolution number thirty six. Uh, what do we do about resolution number 35? It's on the agenda as a separate item. Okay. All right. Uh, that is the order of election resolution ordering governing board members election and notice to consolidate. And you have that resolution in front of you. This is what it looks like. Okay. Is there a motion to pass this? So moved. Marsha moves. Second? Second. Three seconds. Discussion? Hearing none, we move to a vote. All in favor, say aye. Oops. Resolution. Oops. Yes. I will remember one of these days. Trustee Adams? Aye. Trustee Moon? Aye. Trustee Cronenger? Aye. Trustee Haslund? Aye. Trustee Jerkowitz? Aye. Trustee Livingston? Aye. 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 Okay, the motion carries. Uh, resolution number 37. This is um, declaring classified school employee week in the Santa Barbara Community College District. And it indicates that that will be held on May 20th through 26th. And we're asking that you resolve and Recognize this as classified school employee week. Ice cream social again? No. Well, I don't mean to embarrass her, but sometimes they've done a wonderful ice cream social as a way of recognizing this. Could we could we move to pass on the basis of the You know, I would encourage that and I'd like pistachio, please. Okay. Is there a motion to approve this resolution? Maury Jerkowitz moves. Joan seconds. Is there a discussion of the resolution? Hearing none, we move to a roll call vote. Aye. 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 Motion carries. 2.4 board policies. Sue, are you going to help us with those? Those are two very straightforward policies that were discussed at a study session earlier, um, and I would submit them for your approval. They relate to campus security and access and to off-campus student organizations, and these are the beginning of a series of policies, new and modified, that we will bring you as a result of modifications to federal legislation, the Clery Act. These are included as uh, attachment 2.4. Can we take these together? Yes. Is there a motion to approve these two board policies? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Motion is carried unanimously. Item three. Good thing you're already at the podium. I looked ahead and thought I might as well stay up here and wait. I have my usual set of edits for these items. So on page three, under uh, certificated faculty appointments, Clark Hochstetler, counselor in DOPS, I, DSPS, I want to make a modification to the start date. Um, that will be August 6th rather than August 23rd. On page four, certificated faculty change of appointment. This relates to the parent-child workshops. The IA has taken great exception to the language that I used here to, to try to describe and, and clarify what the basis of change was. This is an increase in compensation and it's a change that is driven by curriculum modification that extended the work year and, ex and, and extended the workload. Um, I think that we're just going to have to agree to disagree about whether it's a schedule or not, but that's not the point. So I think what I would like to do is modify this to say that we're, this is a modification of the workload and work calendar that was previously negotiated with the Instructors Association in June 2010 based on a percentage of selected uh, portions of Schedule 10 
um, and with additional uh, rules for rating in an advancement negotiated and that we're now moving that to a, a work year workload that is reflected simply by looking at 80% of Schedule 10 Class 2-6. Sorry for that complicated explanation, but um, I've also explained to you the rationale for this item. And then on page 5, under classified appointments, the buyer for textbooks, I'm pleased to announce that that position will be filled by Andrea Inks, rate 26 slash 6, date, uh, start date is May 1st, 2012. But I also need to tell you, and we didn't know this at the time because we didn't know who was going to fill the position, that it now qualifies to be moved down one item as a promotion. And oh, I think that does it. Yeah. Okay. So I submit this to you for your approval. Is there a motion to approve the, the items on the consent calendar? Okay, Marsha moves. Is a second? Okay, a second. Discussion? Almost has somebody join us. Hearing none, we move to a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Uh, abstentions? No abstentions, all right. It's unanimous. I have an action item for you. Okay. Okay. Um, this is um, to recognize formally by making good on those checks that we gave earlier, the outstanding classified employees and honorable mention classified employees. Um, and I would submit that for your approval. Okay. Where are you on the agenda? I am at the very bottom of page 11. Oh, that's right. Three point two. You need an, uh, a motion to approve. Please. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Luis moves. Joan seconds. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Are there abstentions? Motion is passed. And I have another action item for you. <laughs> and that is um, B, which is the approval of the working schedules for the 11 and 12 month certificated educational administrators and the 10 month certificated faculty. Motion to approve. Okay. Lisa moves. Is there a second? Maury seconds. Is there a discussion of this? Maury? Pardon? Did you have your hand up? No. Oh, okay. Okay. I hear I no discussion. <laughs> yes, I know. You, your hand was still up. Oh. All right. Uh, I hear none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Uh, are there abstentions? There are none. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Before Sue gets seated. Oh, yes. I'll let you do it. Before you get seated, uh, I wrote a note to you the other day, and uh, but I want to do so publicly. I want to express my sincere appreciation, and, I, and on behalf of the board, uh, you, you did huge amounts of work on behalf of the search process. And uh, I, you know, I, any time I was, I was in doubt as to where we were, you had, you had an answer. And I, I really want you to know that we appreciate it so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Sue. Thank you. And thank you, Marty, for the prompt. Yes. <laughs> or Lisa, Lisa, for the prompt. <laughs> OK. Uh, education programs. Good evening, President Haslin, members of the board, and Dr. Friedlander. Um, I'll begin with item 4.2 since we've already done item 4.1, and that is to recommend approval of new programs, course, and program modifications and program deactivations from the last three meetings of the Curriculum Advisory Committee. And you'll note that it's a very long list, and I should just say that when we remove the plus hours from all of our classes, uh, the department chairs had to go in and do a tremendous amount of work of making the program modifications, and that's why the list is very long. Okay. Questions? 
of Maryland. Uh, is there a motion to approve? Motion is made to approve. Second. Um, questions? Hearing none, we move to a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Motion carried. Okay, next is item 4.3, which is to recommend approval to an increase in the student health fee. Um, at the April 6th meeting of the Associated Student Senate, they reviewed and endorsed a motion um, to increase the mandatory health fee by $1 from $17 to $18, effective fall 2012. Um, the last increase was in spring 2008. And the summer session fee, which will also increase by $1, will not increase until the next summer session in 2013. And you say the Student Senate approved this, this increase? That's correct. Can you tell me, what, what was the rationale for? Everything has gone up. <laughs> Why do I ask? Why do I ask? Scott may have more information. We were actually in support of that, um, primarily due to the benefits it would extend to students. Some students can't um, come at the current hours that they're open, so we were in contact with the health department and seeing um, what was the cost-benefit analysis on this, and after reviewing that, we found it to be a good thing, so that was okay. good. Well, thank you, Scott. Okay, is there a motion to approve? Motion is made. Is there a second? And second. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Motion is carried. Item 4.4. I am very pleased to present our presenters for the Get Focused, Stay Focused Progression in Education program, and it'll be Dr. Jack Friedlander, Dr. Diane Hullums, and the very new Dr. Lauren Wintermeyer, she, she just received her um, doctoral degree. Mm -hmm. This may be her first presentation as a doctor. <laughs> yeah, at this hour, uh, pay attention to the title of this, Get Focused, Stay Focused. <laughs> right. the, um, this is an incredible initiative. It's um, the college working in partnership with the um, Carpeteria Unified High School District and the Santa Barbara Unified High School District. And it involves having all of their ninth graders take a, um, a course um, where they start developing their 10-year educational and career plans. And now um, we're getting tremendous support from the teachers and the principals and superintendent, you know, superintendents to put in modules in a 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade. And the purpose of this is that students will start um, in actually an eighth grade summer bridge program going into uh, ninth grade, where they start exploring um, what are the career opportunities and when they that are available that they're interested in. Then they say, well, what um, do I have to do educationally to achieve those career objectives? And that's what drives their educational plan. Um, then in 10th grade, uh, they, um, they have 16 weeks of modules that again broaden the range of career opportunities they look at. They update their 10-year plan and their educational plan. So their educational plan now is driven by where they want to be in terms of their careers. Then they do the same thing in 11th grade and 12th grade, but each time they're getting the activities, and Lauren and Diane will go over these activities, they're getting through the process of selecting the college they want to go to um, and major and getting the application process in, looking for financial aid, learning about financial literacy, um, and doing everything they need to do. They're also doing uh, career explorations, uh, having uh, people from the business community talk to them about the various career opportunities, um, giving them um, opportunities to actually visit businesses so they understand what it is they think they're interested in. It's a very different model. So the whole philosophy is that if students know what their tr the goal is, um, then 
and then they have a plan to get there, they'll be more um, driven and motivated to achieve that goal. And so when they come to college, they're college ready, meaning they don't need remediation, and they're career ready, knowing what area they want to major in, which, and it can change, but at least they have an idea. Let me tell you why it's so important. Nationwide, in community colleges, 60% uh, of the students that enter community colleges need some form of remediation in reading, writing, and or math. California, it's over 70%. Our college, it's 70%. It costs, um, the states and federal two billion dollars a year to provide remediation of high school students going into community colleges two billion dollars a year second thing is the informed declared major what the research shows over and over again is that students who um, form a major and have an idea what they want to do in terms of career wise in the first entering college or by the end of the first year of college will be more likely to return a second year. In, in California community colleges and nationwide, over 25% of the students who are full-time students with the goal of the degree certificate or transfer don't return for a second year. That cost um, the state of California $130 million in investment in terms of um, you know, what they pay for education in community colleges. $130 million um, is a lost investment because they're not coming back and they don't come back within six years. And that's what that figure is based on. The um, having a clear college and post-secondary education path, um, they have it going in. But the main thing is what they learn in ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade, and twelfth grade is how to modify that. When I get exposed to maybe I'm interested in something else, so they know how to um, upgrade their um, career plan and their educational plan accordingly. And they also know in high schools exactly what courses they have to take to achieve their. Um, the goals when they go to college. And they can enroll in our dual enrollment program while they're taking classes and get up to a year's worth of um, college credit done while they're still in high school. What's different here is most students, you say, well, what do you want to do next? I don't know, I want to go to college. Um, what do you want to do? I don't know. Um, what do you want to major in? I think this area I'll figure it out. Here, it's driven just the opposite. You know, what do you want to do? Um, what majors will get you there? What college offers that best major for you to get to where you want to go? So it's a very different way of looking at things. So that's the um, goals of uh, this program. The um, outcomes are on the slide there. Um, students start off in the ninth grade exploring three careers, and every year after that, they keep on adding more careers. Um, they get financial literacy training. Um, they get to create this online um, career and education plan. They um, learn about career opportunities um, and pathways. They um, start their um, planning process for applying for college, um, even taking the right courses to take um, that will count towards their degree in college. And they have um, opportunities to um, participate in a dual enrollment program. And also, and I'll talk about this later, um, there's a handoff to City College. If they still need remediation, they go into our Express Success Program and get that done in a semester. If they don't, they go into our uh, Transfer Success Programs and they'll get finished. We tell them if they follow our advice in two years or less. Um, and that linkage is there. Um, so, and that linkage starts in 11th grade, 12th grade. So this is gonna be huge um, because what the data show for California, if every year we produced 1% more students 2% more students with an associate degree, and 1% more students who got a baccalaureate degree, that would generate $20 billion in economic activity for the um, state, $1.2 billion in increased tax revenues, and 725,000 new jobs um, because they had the skills and qualifications needed you know, to grow jobs um, in the state. So the return to taxpayers is huge. And we feel that this is such a transformative effort because most efforts with schools say you'll get financial aid or you get a scholarship if you finish this. They give them campus tours, but you're not going into curriculum. Here, they get the cooperation of all the teachers in all the school districts and go into ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade curriculum, plus the handoff is, um, I don't know if any other community can pull this off.
that we're pulling this off. And uh, it's really a tribute to Diane and Lauren, who I'm turning this over to. And, and high school principals and superintendents have just been terrific on this uh, partnership. So with that, um, I think who's up is uh, Diane. Good evening, members of the board and President Haslin. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. Um, Jack did a wonderful job in, in sort of previewing what's going on with this initiative. And my task is to tell you how it came about just for a couple of minutes. Because um, as Jack just mentioned, it's pretty remarkable that in this community, all ninth graders are doing this course, have opportunity for college credit, you know, that we have all of this buy-in and it didn't just happen. Um, we've been building the dual enrollment program robustly since 1998. I've been involved with it since then. And um, so it's, you know, we've incrementally been building relationships. That's what it's all about. So that now, you know, after these amount of years, you know, we're sort of like one big happy family. We're not always happy, but, you know, we're, we operate as a seamless educational system um, and that just doesn't happen in very many places to the degree that it happens here. So um, that's the reason that we can move forward with an initiative like this. The other thing that's helped us is um, grant money. And, you know, we love grant money. And a lot of times we get grants and, you know, we'll do some um, initiative that sort of, it's nice while we're doing it and then it, it kind of goes away. Um, the good thing about this is that this initiative is systemic. The um, school district, the Santa Barbara Unified School District is considering making this ninth grade course a graduation requirement. Well, that's a systemic change. And so thanks to the James Irvine Foundation, which gave us a significant grant for their concurrent courses initiative, that was a three-year grant, it was primarily focused on career technical, but this ninth grade course that you're gonna hear about from Lauren um, really focuses on um, career technical. It is, in reality, a career technical course itself. And that initiative allowed us to get textbooks and supplies and do the professional development um, that's needed for this. The other grant that keeps us going is the SB70 initiative from the <coughs> Chancellor's Office. That's also focused on career technical, and you know it's a statewide um, grant. The newest legislation is SB1070, which is going through now. Um, so those funds is, have allowed us to do this. So back in 2009, I went to San Francisco and saw a presentation about a curriculum, and um, there are are many curricula out there. There's a lot to choose from. But this particular curriculum had this electronic 10-year plan associated with it. And you know that's one of the things that made it very different. Um, and so I was excited about it and came back. And because we had already had these relationships being built and ongoing, we were able to call together 30 local K-12 administrators and um, faculty counselors, a few of our folks, to a meeting in May of 2009. And you know they got a presentation of what this was about, and they got excited. And so by fall of 2009, we had Carpinteria High School and Dos Pueblos willing to pilot, which is kind of remarkable. And it's just kind of built from there. The course that we use for the ninth grade course is Pro 138D, which just means it's a three unit course in personal planning. And the credit, um, it's, it's optional for the students. You know, all these students are getting the course, and if they would like to um, complete the paperwork and opt for dual enrollment credit, it's a pass, no pass grading. They're ninth graders. We realize this. Um, then they do. And so you can see on this slide, um, if you look at the last bullet, um, so far about 1,000 students have opted for that dual enrollment credit. Uh, all students, all ninth graders at Carpinteria, San Marcos, San, and Santa Barbara High School um, are doing this. Dos Pueblos has about five sections. Dos Pueblos, uh, you know, has many initiatives going on, so they're a little bit different. But they're all involved with us to the same level, so to the same degree. Um, 
high school teachers, counselors, and administrators are now getting together. In fact, we're meeting at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. All the principals are going. So, you know, there's just been a lot of engagement and cooperation we're to a meeting um, as we talk about implementing these modules. They're actually, they're not 16 weeks, they're 16 hours in each of grade 10, 11, 12. 16 hour modules that will provide the follow up curriculum because okay we do a course in ninth grade but then what you know they forget about it or you know it kind of goes by the wayside and we realize that doesn't work there needs to be follow up Lauren will talk more about that so we're meeting to to plan the implementation of 10th grade 16 hour modules for 10th grade so we're meeting tomorrow um, that follow-up curriculum will allow them to retouch their 10-year plan and to, they can change their mind but they're learning how to set goals do critical thinking and they're making that educational plan so our hope is by the time they reach our doors they're not just checking a box for a major because they think they have to they'll really know what they're doing and that will inform all of our good title V initiatives that are going on like Jack said uh, the other good thing is that the, the modules that um, are being created are tied to the new Common Core standards. So that's very attractive to K-12. We hear more and more about that and um, another reason for their buy-in. So now I'm going to turn it over to Lauren who will give you uh, just a few more details. Good evening, President Haslin, members of the board. Thank you for your time and attention this evening. I want to talk a little bit about why this initiative is so important for our students and I come to you with the background of a K-12 educator, um, a master's in counseling and now I have the honor of being an administrator here at City College and working intersegmentally within our school districts and with the college to look at how to create a seamless transition for our students. We realize how important the implementation of the common core standards are, particularly because they speak to students' career and college readiness. The old model was pick a college based on location. We know students still come to our beautiful campus for that. But what used to happen was a student would come and explore, maybe try out some classes. They don't really have that leisure any longer. And it used to take students maybe a couple years to pick a major. Oftentimes they'd graduate with a wonderful degree in philosophy and maybe not know how to use it effectively to find a career. So we have really reversed that model to say what are the careers that meet with your strengths and interests. Now, as Jack said, how do we find out the major that will prepare you adequately and appropriately for that career? And then how do we backward map to finding an appropriate institution that meets your family's needs, your interests, your budget, all of those wonderful tools? And hopefully for many of our local students, they can get that start here at City College. So working with the Common Core Standards is really important as we know that contextualized learning and the real world hands-on experiences that students have will better prepare them for their future. We also want to create a bridge for those exiting graduating seniors to come into our programs ready and able to come in to express a success or express a transfer with a, an informed student education plan so that they've already tried filling out these forms on their own with information and when they come to our counselors it's not a blank piece of paper. It's a student walking in informed saying this is my education plan, this is where I'm going, please help me get there. We know that parents really appreciate that, of course, because they don't want career students on their hands. And we know we need an informed workforce so that our community can continue to grow and we're meeting the demands of our industry partners as well. As Marilyn wonderfully said, thank you for sharing that I did finish my dissertation and I'm really thrilled that I was able to look at our dual enrollment program and how it collaborates across the schools to hopefully better prepare students for City College. California was the first state to have dual enrollment and yet there's very little studies that have been conducted around concurrent and dual enrollment policies. So I did examine the graduating local seniors of 2008 who matriculated to us in the fall of 2008 and compared those who had had dual enrollment experience with those who had not. Overwhelmingly students applied at, to participate full time in our programs. They had a reduced need for remediation which we know is very important. They also were, I think, more informed about what their future plans were, knowing that they had to have a higher GPA to transfer. And we did see that not only in the first term standalone, but cumulatively over three years, they had a higher cumulative GPA and accumulation of transferable courses. 
I further an analyzed that former dual enrollment group by where they took dual enrollment courses and looked at high school only, college campus only, and a combination. And as you can imagine, students who had experiences in both locations outperformed those who took classes in isolation. So our hope with this ninth grade course is that students are being introduced to dual enrollment in ninth grade and all of the opportunities they'll have to participate at City College on their high school campus and our campus going forward. As Diane mentioned, in the ninth grade course, students are using the Career Choices curriculum and answering these three key questions. Who am I? What do I want? And how do I get it? So finding out what a student's strengths are and what motivates them is really the first important part of engaging student in their education. Rather than it being the teacher directing the student, the student needs to direct their education because that's where the motivation to stick with those tough courses is really going to come from and that we hope is building their resiliency. And the, what do I want? That's the financial literacy and the budget building. It's the reality check for our students. And when we've interviewed them, that's when the students say, I now thank my parents for paying rent and keeping food on the table because they know how much it costs to live in our community. How do I get it also gives them a reality check that I might not be able to be a professional soccer player. It's a great dream, but it's probably a good idea to have a backup plan. So at the end of this one semester course, they really do have a sound reality check on multiple pathways that they can choose from. We want to support their dreams, but we want them to know how to plan the best they can for their future, especially with our very uncertain economy. In the 10th grade, we again have students revisit the career fields looking at high demand industry. We familiarize them with the one-stop website for the U.S. Department of Labor and give students the information about high demand jobs and how does their interests fit into what the labor is demanding. And we know right now, we can't possibly know the technological jobs that are going to be available for today's current high school students. It changes so rapidly. In 11th grade, students are looking at STEM fields, which is such a broad term that I think people usually think only means science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And what we know for students is that regardless of their interests, it somehow connects to a STEM field. So there are a lot of opportunities, especially with our new grants here on campus, for students to get plugged in earlier to events like a science night and opportunities that we do outreaching here from the college. We also want students in 11th grade to have an identified post-secondary path. Whether or not they think they're going to college, going through the steps of preparing for college will help them, even if they choose to go into the workforce and come back to us later. And in the 12th grade, we want students to go through the steps of applying for financial aid, applying to college, making sure they've taken their assessment tests if they haven't already done so, and getting as much guidance and support so that we can be a, giving them a bridge and a handoff rather than a send off from the high school to our campus. And I'm going to pass it back over to Diane to talk about benefits. So again, thank you for your time. Lots of benefits. Um, as you can see here, we are, um, the, one of the great benefits is, is that all these students are getting access to the course, the 10 year plan, and the follow-up modules. And in the implementation, what we're talking with the principals about is, you know, in order to have all students get access to the 16 hours of modules in each grade, um, they're probably going to be in English classes or, or social studies. Carpinteria has a different sort of approach, but um, they believe in that. You know, we want to keep access to all students at, at the top of the, of the list. Um, so I, you know, as Lauren just mentioned, students become their own advocates after they get this information, hopefully. I do want to mention here, it's not on the slide, but an important factor to us is longitudinal research. Here we have this great model and, you know, it's being implemented everywhere, but we really need the longitudinal research and data all the way through Santa Barbara City College. And UCSB wants to be our partner. Um, Jack, I may be stealing your thunder. I apologize. Can I talk about the funding? <laughs> um, we received a very generous um, donation from Mr. Carl Lindros, a community member, um, to get the research started, and it was matched by the Santa Barbara Foundation. Uh, so we have $20,000, so we're beginning the research with UCSB. We've had the meetings. 
everything, uh, you know, all the planning is taking place. Um, so you'll be seeing that contract actually on the May board. So all the discussions are happening. And that, but that's only the beginning. That only is the, like bridge research, we're calling it, um, because they want to capture student data right away. The big longitudinal research project, they're actually um, talking about going after their own grant to do this research. They're very interested, and they're excellent team um, at, the, at UCSB. So we're really happy about that. Um, the last bullet on this slide um, is, is the only one I'll mention here, demystifying the college going process. And we know that is a big gap for us. We've always known that, you know, students, you know, they get outreach from the college. We have dual enrollment. We have all these things going on at, at K-12. But there's, there's still this gap once they graduate and leave. Something happens over the summer and then they come here and they sort of start over. And we don't want that to happen. That's why we named this Get Focused, Stay Focused. So we want to demystify that process. Um, I think it's pretty obvious the benefits to everybody, so I'm not going to, you know, belabor that. I do want to mention just one thing, though, and that's the achievement gap. Um, and then I'll turn it back to Jack. We don't have high dropout rates in Santa Barbara, thankfully. You know, our educational institutions do a wonderful job. The, the dropout rate is very low. What, what the, there is, and, you know, we've talked about with our partners, there's an achievement gap. And our high school partners want to narrow the achievement gap. We want to reduce the need for remediation when they get here. So that's one big focus of our initiative is to narrow that achievement gap. Um, the other things I think are pretty self-explanatory and I'll turn it back to Jack to wrap up. I pretty much already went through the benefits of SPCC. The um, next step is to acquire the funding needed to implement this whole model over the um, next four or five years. So we um, have been in contact with a number of foundations locally and nationally, and there's a lot of interest in it. Um, I'm just this weekend refining a five-page prospectus um, for that funding uh, to, to do it. We have um, the Partners in Education um, and the County Office of Education is um, collaborating with us as well. And that brings in the business community. It's really um, a huge community effort, um, what we're doing. And um, I just cannot believe that we're um, actually making this happen. So that's you know, where, where we are. But I think um, you know, the, it fits into overall vision of um, just get focused, stay focused. They come to the college, express success. If they need to get through remediation fast, um, express the transfer. They need to get through that transfer program and, and transfer in two years or less. The Career Technology Education Group, um, they'll be meeting. They started meeting, and we're re looking at repackaging and revisioning how we do career tech education. Um, so it's responsive to people of all different um, ages of life that they need access. And that's the overall um, vision, and um, they're all, it's all happening parallel along with the uh, Continuing Education and the Center for Lifelong Learning. So um, that's the damage we're doing this year, but I think it's great work, and um, we'll see if it all works. So that's it. I'm open, I'm open to questions. Yeah, John. Trustee really not questions, but yeah. definitely compliments. This is the most timely project. We've been talking about these issues and the fact that this got started well before the Student Success Task Force. This just says Santa Barbara City College sees a problem and we've been seeing the problem and you did something about it and you did something with the same depth of quality that we always associate with our work. We research it, we look for it, we work collaboratively. This, this is the best that we can be. So Diane, I know you always turn out superb projects, but Lori, congratulations on your PhD and Welcome to the team, but these are the things we can be most proud of. And it sounds very much like exactly what Aspen is looking for. They're looking for interconnectivity. They're looking for partnerships 
in the educational scene and involvement out to the community and obviously moving into the workforce. So I sure hope they get a chance to take a look at what we're doing. And if we need money, that's what Aspirin is there for, that they, they see these projects and the fact that we do the data research, we back it up and show proven results from it is, is just the kind of quality product that we're so proud of that you're doing. And Diane, I always love your statement that you made a number of years ago. We are an entrepreneurial college. Mm -hmm. Ideas come, we make room for them, and they pay off. And sometimes they don't, but we take the chances, and I think that's just always part of who we are. So Jack, you played a role shepherding this through, and I wish you the very best, and certainly hope we do get to showcase this. So we, we good will, work. Um, I just want to comment on two things, Trustee Livingston. Thank you very much for the comp, um, acknowledgement. It really means a lot to our team. Uh, Dr. McDougal, who chaired the Student Task Force, SES Task Force, um, so many of those recommendations came from his knowledge of what we're doing at this college, including everything you just said about this program. And so he's now on the um, board for the Orfla Foundation. And so he is working with us to um, um, look to them for some funding because it fits into a new initiative they're looking at. And Orfla Foundation is very interested in supporting this um, grant. But the reason why he's so jazzed about it, and we, also, we actually got a letter from Jack Scott um, supporting this grant. And what Jack's, Chancellor Scott said is everything you just said. It fits right into the Student Success Task Force recommendations. Um, and we also have a letter of support for this from the Superintendent of, of Schools as well as we go forward for grant funding. So that's where we are on this. So thank you. I know that we have um, a couple items to get to. And again, I want to acknowledge um, the great work that um, Diane has been doing over the years. You know, Lauren Wintermeyer um, and the schools, our partners at the schools, um, County Office of Education. Um, it's just been um, a marvelous thing. We have problems. Um, we all meet. They're meeting at 7 tomorrow morning to move forward. Um, so these things don't happen by accident, but the leadership has just been terrific. So that's where we are. Glad you mentioned time. How much time do we have in this room? Not much. We have another Oh, we do. Okay. Thank well, you. thank you so much. Uh, Luis had uh, a question, and I, I, I wasn't sure how much time we had left. Yeah, actually, it wasn't a question. I just would, um, again, and I think, you know, I've recommended this in the past. This is the kind of program that would be an excellent workshop at the community college conferences mm -hmm. that we attend because our state needs this type of program up and down. So to share it with other colleges, I think, would be excellent. Um, yeah, so I think it's a good idea. Look at um, I think this time around, we'll. Um, you know, submit an application to uh, be on the programs. Also, you should know that um, we've been showcasing um, parts of our dual enrollment program and early elements of it. We've had groups of people from out the state come to our college. Um, and, um, and Diane and Lauren have been on the road quite a bit. So we decided rather than go to every single college school, how are you doing this? We're doing more and more, we're bringing them here. In fact, I think the league is looking for um, applications for the November I'll have to look at that. Cause, um, yeah. Yeah, I've been passing up on our travel and conference budget, but I think this is so important that we need to figure let's, out how to get there. Let's move on to Good. item five. Thanks, Luis. Uh, Dr. Arellano, would you like to present the continuing education agenda? <clears throat> Angie, is there an update on our time? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, then I'll pass on the formal introduction. I have <laughs> 5.1, which is a, a course modification for your approval. Is there a motion to approve? So move. Okay. I see all kinds of motions. <laughs> Luis moves and Lisa seconds. Discussion? All in favor say aye. Hi. Hi. Oh, I had a question. Can some of these take classes be taken as standalone, or do they have to be taken in the whole series? I'll answer that. This this course is actually part of a certificate that's on 5.2 for the digital design uh, basic certificate. It will 
the, the certificate has a sequence of courses, so this is not necessarily a standalone course, but it's part of a certificate program. Right, but can someone yes. take it as a standalone yes. still? Okay. okay, thank you. My intro to Mac, no. <laughs> I still need to take it. Uh, let's make sure that we have that vote. All in favor, say aye. Mm. Aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions? <clears throat> okay. Uh, item 5.2. 5.2 is uh, proposed state-funded uh, certificates. Uh, and I do want to clarify, even though these are listed as new certificates, we actually do have one uh, basic computer certificate that um, entails 24 courses, and we have not had any student complete that certificate because of the number of courses. So what the faculty did is they revamped the courses and created these smaller certificates for your approval. Motion to approve. Absolutely. Lisa and Joan. Uh, all discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? <coughs> Motion carried. 5.3 is uh, recommend approval of uh, tu tuition-based uh, fee courses. Okay, that's attachment 5.3. Mm -hmm. All right. Motion to approve. Joan? Second. Uh, Marsha? Discussion? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Okay. Uh, 5.4 is recommend approval of the continuing ed division uh, calendar for 12 13. That's attachment 5.4. Is there a motion to approve? Lisa? And uh, second? Second. Louise seconds. Okay, discussion on the calendar? Joan? Yeah, I guess since we had that recent discussion with the summer term for credit, is there any talk at this point about not having summer continuing education? I know there was a problem because some of them in the past needed to keep moving through the year, but is that? We're, we're, we're keeping, um, continuing education has been offering a very limited summer session, but we're, we're staying with it. Okay. Okay. Can I also, oh, go ahead. Um, Marsha. And I was just going to confirm, Jack, yes. you and I discussed uh, all the courses we're going to be offering are. Yeah, we're, we're going to be offering all the courses according to, um, in terms of length and hours. It, what was approved in the um, state approved curriculum course of record outlines. So we're adhering to um, you know, what was in the approved course study outlines <coughs> and that's what's dictating how many hours and length of time they meet. Okay. Marty? Just, um, can we, next time we do some uh, calendar like this, can we also have the, the um, times for applying for a scholarship? Hmm. And it should be as close to the beginning of the term as possible. There's been a a, um, a gap between the um, when you have to apply and when school starts, and I think if we could get it closer, it would be better. But it would be good to see it on here okay. so that mm -hmm. it can be widely distributed so everybody can see it. Good. Thank, thank you. I made a notation. Okay. Um, That's it. All right. Thank you. Business, Joe. We're on to item six, business services. Did we vote on this last? I don't think we did. So we're back on 5.4. There was a motion, it was seconded. We've had the discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Motion passes, Joe. Okay, we're on to item six, business services. Um, item 6.1 is business consent items. Is there a motion to approve? Lisa approves mm -hmm. with a motion. Is there a second? Motion dies for lack of a second. Oh, no? I'll second. Oh, Marty seconds. Rescue. Uh, is there a di discussion on the motion before us? Hearing none, we move to a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Motion is carried. Okay, item 6.2A, the adoption of the resolution number 38, authorizing routine internal budget transfers. And 6.2B, the adoption of resolution number 39, providing for the 2011-12 budget revisions due to receipt of unbudgeted revenue, can be taken together, if you'd like to. Is there a motion to approve both resolutions? Moved by Maury, second by Joan. Uh, is there discussion? Yes. 
Um, Joe, could you just briefly review what projects were being covered by the transfer of 690000 from contingency fund uh, in, uh, to capital outlay in our construction fund? I, I didn't bring the list of those projects with me, but um, I can tell you those are the projects that were discussed earlier in the year um, for actually implementation during the summer. Those are the ones that are funded through internal funds, their deferred maintenance projects. Um, so um, primarily, they'd be deferred maintenance on the on on the campus. I should remember some of them, but it's been several months since we discussed them, and, and I just don't have them. Okay. On the so what we're doing here is we're putting the money to work over the summer, and those are the projects that were discussed. Yes, those previously. are the projects that were brought earlier in the year. Um, there were listed like six projects, um, like repaving in certain areas and learning um, resources. The what? Learning Resources Center? No, this is the LRC was in the consent agenda. It's okay. a separate item. These are actually it's just not projects in this. Okay. that came up over the course of the year that we knew we needed to do. So, um, okay. I can, I'll, I'll send you the list out. I can send That's you. fine. I just thought it would be helpful for people to know. Yeah, I apologize. Okay, we have two resolutions before us. We will go to a roll call vote. Trustee Adams? Aye. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Aye. 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 We have 6.2C is the adoption of resolution number 40 providing for payment of an outdated warrant. I'm dated 11-26-2008 for $249.94. This could take a long time to debate. <laughs> I, so. I mean, is there... Well, the debate is, did you round up the round up for 94 cents? Okay. Okay, is there a motion to approve? So Marsha and Joan. Uh, discussion? No. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay? Oh, resolution. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. I look. Aye. 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 Item 6.2E is the instructional services agreements between Santa Barbara City College and Star King, San Marcos, Lou Grant, and the Oaks Parent-Child Workshops for the provision of non-credit parent education courses at the workshops. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. Is there a discussion? Joan? Yeah, I just want to be clear about this because we discussed at study session that this is going to be subsidized if we don't get Chancellor's Office funding, and I'd like to know what would be the scope of this well, possible no, subsidy? No, right, right now, right now um, these courses are still funded um, as non-enhanced uh, right. classes. So the funding is there um, you know, this year and next year. Beyond that, if there's a change in legislation, it wouldn't take place until um, and there is no legislation right now to defund these courses. They're just saying, in terms of non-enhanced, you know, make them a lower priority in terms of um, how we allocate. That so would be an internal choice on our part, or it's an internal it would choice. Be it's an internal choice to um, continue to support these um, next year um, non-enhanced classes. And Do we, we have started a policy on which non-enhanced classes we choose to support. We don't have a policy. We probably should. We should probably have a policy on that. I'll just give that direction to mm -hmm. those that come after me. But if we're going to be subsidizing non-enhanced, there, there needs to be a policy why we pick one program over another. So I'll just, just advise board members they probably should think about that. But I would like to, because I know it's an extraordinary amount of money, so I'd like to put it on the table in the interest of transparency so you can start comparing if you're subsidizing these non-enhanced, how are you justifying you're not subsidizing others? And that's a critical issue of how we do business. So can you give me a ballpark of what it might be well, subsidized? I don't look at it as subsidizing. I'm looking at um, it's an agreement that we started talking about you know, you know, a long time ago, this past summer. Um, and this is just getting the agreement, you know, through fruition for uh, this year and next year. And the board um, will need to take a look at it, you know, going forward. 
after this, you know, the agreement this year and next year, in terms of you know where the funding is and what the priorities are, at that point. We we just went through budget hearings where different activities were identified with a right. dollar amount, and I didn't see anything that might have to be pulled out of general operational funds to subsidize this. So I think the question is a fair one. Could we could we defer the answer, however, until a subsequent meeting? I'm aware that there are students out waiting outside and we need to move on. Yes. I'd just like to say that it's not a subsidy. It is reimbursed by the state at this point, as Jack has said. So let's move on. And okay. I'd like to clarify, I said the potential subsidy of it. If it's reimbursed by the state, that's not the problem. The issue is should it become a potential subsidy and the policy being what is our policy to choose to subsidize well, some non-enhanced non-credit over other non-enhanced non-credit. That I think is you, what I've been saying. The, the question is lodged and we will try to answer it. Let's, if we can, move to a vote. I think there's, this is a resolution. It's not a resolution. <laughs> we'll get it. Would you, would you please make up my mind? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Nay. Abstentions? The motion is carried. The next one is the adoption of a resolution number 41 for the 10% progress payment retention amount for the Humanities Building Modernization Project that was discussed at the um, study session on April 23rd. Oh. Uh, is there a motion it, to approve the resolution? So moved. Uh, Motion's made, Marty, and mm -hmm. okay. Discussion of the motion? Hearing none, we move to a vote. Trustee Annan? Aye. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Cronenberg? Aye. Trustee Haslund? Aye. Trustee Livingston? Aye. Trustee Mackert? Aye. Trustee Diego? Aye. And the last item is a tort claim of Patricia Haggard. Uh, against the district for medical expenses, lost wages, and general specific and special damages for inju injuries allegedly suffered as a student in the vocational nursing program at SBCC on March 5, 2012. The claim for damages was submitted on 3-23-12, and the recommendation is that the claim be denied as there is no liability on the part of SBCC or its employees. Do you need a vote? you need a motion on that? No, it's a vote. I mean, it's... Do you need a motion to deny? Yes. Okay. I hear, I hear you shaking your head up and down. That means yes to me. Okay. Uh, Maury, did you want to make that motion? Yes. Okay. And Marcia seconds. Uh, discussion on the motion? All right. All in favor of the motion to deny the claim, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Motion is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I believe that brings us to the end of our deliberations. Uh, we will reconvene on May 10th. Peter, uh, hmm? I think we were adjourning until May 10th. I'm yeah, adjourned. No. Yes. Okay. Um, we we will adjourn this meeting until May 10th, when our our next study session is scheduled, at which time. It will be reconvened as a regular meeting for the purpose of taking formal action on Dr. Gaskin's contract. Okay. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Without objection, we are adjourned.